Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, graduate admission workshop. Um, I think it's a good idea to put uh, all these lectures together, lectures that uh, help you to find out and learn more about graduate school, as well as hopefully to attract your, uh, you know, your interest and spark your interest in graduate school, and hopefully uh, make you uh, pursue your career in, in academia. Um, so, um, um, very briefly about myself before we get started. My name is Dmitry Kurowski. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics uh, here at Texas a and I'm also the member of the Institute of Quantum Science and Engineering, uh, the virtual institution that is hosted by the Department of Physics. And I'm a member of the Department of Biomedical Engineering here at Texas a and um, As you can see from all these titles, uh, my research interests span across a variety of different disciplines, ranging from uh, biochemistry and biophysics to physics and biology. Uh, same uh, conclusion can be made from my academic training. I got my PhD in upstate New York uh, in analytical chemistry. In parallel, I worked in a small company called Biotools, uh, where I was doing very exciting measurements, uh, just because we could not afford to have the instrument that Biotools was making. So there was an opportunity to go to uh, Jupiter, Florida, which was a nice place. Uh, if uh, you consider that I was in a cold upstate New York and uh, do measurement for a couple of weeks, it was also a very, very productive collaboration. We published more than 10 papers. But uh, what, is, what was the most important is that I learned how the small company uh, works and operates. Um, after graduation, I decided to pursue an academic career. And of course, the most natural and logic step, I joined uh, the laboratory of Rick Van Dyne as a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Northwestern University. Rick uh, was the member of National Academy of Sciences. He deceased about a year ago, which is a big loss for all of us. But um, after working about three years in his lab, I decided to go and uh, get a taste of industry. And that's what makes me distinctly different from uh, most of my colleagues who uh, pursue uh, uh, their academic career straight from the postdoc, uh, getting into the university. I got in a pharma company, which was a great experience. I learned first how industry works. I learned what is very important to, to have uh, uh, for uh, applicants. Uh, if you want to get a job in uh, the uh, in, in industry uh, in general, in pharma company in particular, uh, as well as I learned how uh, people make drugs, how drugs are developed, how all this kitchen uh, uh, is is uh, functioning. And uh, about after about two years working at Boring Ingelheim, I joined Texas A&M University, where I run my own group. Uh, we uh, a pretty diverse uh, number of guys. Um, in terms of our background, but uh, primarily we work in nanoscale structure characterization of uh, amyloid aggregates as well as viruses. We also develop um, non-invasive uh, diagnostics of plant diseases using Raman spectroscopy. And, uh, you know, um, to be very honest, uh, so uh, what you could probably see from, or you could probably hear from a bunch of these terms and uh, kind of uh, uh, highlights of our research and research that I was doing in my academic, uh, uh, in, in my academic career. You hopefully have a curiosity in research in general, uh, but let me first tell you why research is important, uh, because research uh, allows you to answer lots of very important questions. Uh, why and, and how, how things are organized and why they're organized this way. What is the structure of a certain thing? And imagine you can be the very first person who learns how something works, how something is functioning. And of course, that's great. It's very uh, special feeling. And I'm sure that probably 99.99 .99, uh, colleagues from my university are, are, are like that. You know, we just we're just very excited about what we do because we enjoy the feeling uh, to be the first who discovers something. It's just super great feeling. And if it's you, then your place is here, you know, in, 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 a, in a research lab, in the university. Also, you can be very strategic about your research. Uh, say you, um, uh, you want to have a plan B, and plan B is dental or medical school. Well, then research is a very important component of your resume or CV. Why? Because imagine uh, that there will be a lot of people who shadow a physician, who shadow a dentist, uh, as well as volunteer someone on the front desk. Uh, well, 
if you do that, of course, it's better than to, you know, just chill on the couch and play Xbox, but still it won't set you apart as efficiently as research. If you have done research for a year or two in your resume, it will look very nice. It would mean, it would mean to the admission committee, both in dental and medical school, as well as in grad school, that you are very motivated and excited person, that you, have, you, are, you are very enthusiastic. And of course, us in a graduate school, as well as our colleagues in, in dental and medical school, we want to have enthusiastic, motivated students, okay? So if you do research, that is what it shows. It shows that you were not chilling on the couch, you, you got in a research lab, you work hard, uh, maybe you, you, you put a poster together and you present in a poster, we're going to talk about this in a second, or maybe you, you, you publish a paper, or at least you have a recommendation letter, uh, which is, again, very, very important. And you can consider research as, as a strategic uh, move uh, in, in, in to improve your CV, improve your resume. And as you can see from the small cartoon of motivation, we all understand that if you work in a research lab, you uh, have enhanced feeling or enhanced understanding about support, about teamwork, about relationship between you and your supervisor. And of course, all these small details are very important if, uh, you know, if you will be in a dental school or if you will be in a graduate school, uh, because there are people who want want to be sure that you know you're you're uh, you're uh, you fit in the environment you're good with your colleagues you know you're not clashing with your colleagues and so on same of course in a, in uh, in graduate school it's even more important because for us when we admit you we want to be sure that you have tasted research you know what you're signing for right uh, specifically because well if you have never worked in a lab and you say that you want to work in in the lab for the next five years I would be a little bit suspicious whether you actually know what you're signing for, because um, research is challenging. Sometimes things don't work, sometimes protein is not expressing and so on. And we wanna know that you are prepared for this, right? So if you uh, want to pursue your career in a graduate school, research is a super important component, okay? And the more time you spend in a research lab, the better it will look in our eyes, right? Even if you, uh, if something, didn't work in one lab and you move to another lab, it's still great, right? It adds up to your experience and, and we value it. Personally, if I would have to choose between full A guy, uh, I mean like A grade guy and B guy who, uh, A guy who have never, never seen the lab, never worked in the lab and the B guy who had some uh, research experience working in the lab, I would prefer B guy because I know that that person is ready for what uh, for what he's uh, going to do in his in his life. Okay. Well, say um, you are excited about research. I hope at least a little bit, and you understand why it is important in your career, in your uh, in your future life. The question is how you get started. You know, what is the first step to do? Well, you want to listen to your heart and and get a feeling what you actually like. Uh, often the inspiration can come from a professor. Say you had a great uh, biochemistry professor who was the expert in cancer biology or maybe in plant biology. And that person just polarized you, just really hook you up uh, with his style of teaching or her style of teaching, enthusiasm. And you're like, well, I actually like that person. So I want to work in a cancer biology just because you, you, you really got polarized, you got, you know, just hooked by that personality. And it's very common because personalities overall in science play a huge role. Uh, and often people start working in some area because they really like their advisor or because they really like the professor who taught uh, the class. And, uh, and like I said, it can be your case. You know, if you had, if you had a great uh, professor from your biochemistry, organic chemistry, biology class, anatomy class, well, and you think that, you know, you really like the person, well, approach that person. Maybe that person is running the lab and that will be a good place for you, okay? Often your, um, your motivation or your, um, um, your interest are, are coming from your personal uh, kind of interest or, you know, personal um, curiosity in science. Say you, you like reading science magazines and you like nuclear physics, the particle physics, because you think it's so cool, because 
which is discovered Higgs boson, all of this, and she's like, I want to be, I want to work in physics because it's so cool. Or maybe you uh, follow uh, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, press releases, and you 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 understand that uh, the world population is increasing, and we need to produce more and more plants, and no one knows how to do that. And you can say like, well, I want to make plants bigger and better, so I want to work in plant biology. Again, it's just entirely uh, your personal kind of uh, you know uh, wish or personal curiosity in, in a certain area of biology, physics, or chemistry. Often motivation comes from family. Uh, hope not, uh, but it uh, often happens that uh, one or several members in your family uh, develop some kind of a terrible disease, uh, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And that's what really triggered you to go and do research in this area because we all understand there is no cure uh, from Parkinson's disease and you want to be the person who is going to find that cure right? Because that happened to your grandfather and you lost your grandfather. And you, you say like, it's a very important thing because I lost my family member. And that's why I want to go and do research in this area. That's really, that's really good motivation. Now, what I want to tell you guys, when you kind of uh, shape your motivation, don't forget to put that paragraph in your statement of purpose, because in a statement of purpose, there's nothing better just to tell, start telling the story from what attracted you to the science. Uh, if it's your family uh, loss, or if it's your professor, it's great, just, just put it there. Say, I, I took biochemistry class with Professor Smith, and Professor Smith was the great uh, cancer biologist, and that's what really sparked my interest in cancer, okay? It's, it's completely natural, and it's great. Now say you have a feeling about the research area you want to work in. The question is how to make the next step. What is the next step? Ideally, you want to drop an email to that professor saying, well, Professor Smith, can I meet up with you? And here is the moment when students make a terrible mistake. Students come to the office completely uh, uh, blank with no any clue what the professor Smith is doing, what his lab is working on. And it's terrible. It's really painful. I guess, uh, personally, I have a lot of undergraduate students in my lab, and, and it's, that's why my lab is so successful, uh, just because of their hard work. But often when they come and it's like, hello, it's me here, you're like, because you want to talk about research with that person, and you want to maybe explain the project you want that uh, uh, person to work on. and if you see that the student has no idea what what you're talking about it's very kind of demotivating for us okay so here is a here is a small tip before you uh, show up in a lab uh, so in, in, a, in a professor's office read a little bit about his or her research either from the website or maybe from a paper that this group is publishing i imagine it may be hard for you to go through uh, results and discussion uh, section of that paper, but but introduction is usually pretty open, pretty clear, and pretty straightforward. Explaining what the group is working on, what these guys are doing, what do they study? Whether they they, they study proteins, protein interactions, or they study plants, they study microorganisms, phaging, and so on and so on. So please come prepared. That you will you would gain so much if you show up in the office uh, after reading a little bit about that uh, person's research. You'll see you it was super rewarding. Another thing that, uh, another mistake that students uh, do, they kind of like, they're happy to be taken uh, in a lab, which is a bad thing. It's, it's not completely correct because remember guys, you invest the most valuable resource of your life, it's your time. And you wanna ask, what do you wanna get in return? So it's completely fine to ask your professor, what am I gonna do? Can you please tell me about my project? And of course, what am I going to get as a result of this? And here, you can be absolutely straightforward. I had a student, uh, undergraduate fellow uh, from last year, uh, from my biochemistry class, who uh, was very open and honest upfront, saying he wants he wants to get a paper. And I was like, oh, sure, I understand your motivation. Great. It's not, you know, having being ambitious is a great thing. So of course, you know, if you uh, put it straight on the table that I want to have a poster. Well, I want to go and present this uh, research data somewhere on a, on a mini symposium, or I know that in your lab, you have an awesome confocal microscope and I want to use it. 
Again, it's totally cool. Very likely the PI will tell you, Luke, unlikely you're going to use this by yourself, but together with a graduate student, sure, you're more than welcome. Boom, you cleared your motivation. And now everything clear from professor's side and from your side. Okay. Now, important thing to consider is how much time you want to put uh, for that activity. Here I should tell you the honest thing, guys. If you have uh, an hour or two or three of spare time, this isn't a good idea to join the lab because three hours a week isn't much, okay? Unlikely you can do something. But again, be open on and honest with the professor up front. Say, look, I have three hours. You think it's worth joining your lab? Because there's nothing more disappointing than you will think that, you know, you are in some lab and you expect recommendation later after this, but, the professor has never seen you, neither group members did. And at the end, after a year or a year and a half, you will be like, well, oh, can I get a recommendation letter? And that person will be like, I've never seen you, right? So you don't want to have this. So be open and honest up front. Now, uh, what is a good lab? Uh, the good lab is when you can meet up with the PI uh, as well as with your colleagues and when you can talk openly uh, to them and where you can learn stuff. It's also very important that your research activity isn't primitive. You know, if you're in a lab where you're responsible for washing dishes, it's a bad lab. You don't learn anything there. And the fact that you were in a lab, I mean, you were washing dishes in the lab or feeding some kind of, uh, you know, rats or, or any other life uh, organisms this, these guys are working with, it's kind of, you know, defeating the point of doing research is kind of, you know, what's the point, right? Um, also, it's very important that you understand what you do. And to be honest with you, I'm opening a small secret. That's what we care here a lot. Uh, and I uh, am privileged uh, uh, to be a member of the graduate admission committee in our department in 2018 and 19. And I introduced students and I always wanted to, um, wanted to know what the students understood what do they do. And it doesn't matter how complex is your project, your project can be very simple. But what we want to know, whether you were, you understood what you were doing, or you were just like, you know, you were like a bio robot, you were mixing something or put, you know, putting some kind of reactions without any clue why, why, why this column, why you put gel of this concentration, why this microorganisms, why, right? So you want to answer, to get answers on all these questions. And again, to get answers, you want to reach to your PI or your colleagues and say, like, well, can you please explain why it's like this, why it's like this, all right? Uh, of course, the bad lab is the opposite, okay? Uh, your project isn't working, your project's a complete disaster, no one helps you, you're, like, sitting in a bus, crying, and slowly, slowly, you start dissociating from this lab because you're just like, no one cares about me there, and I just, what am I doing there, okay? So, um, Remember that uh, there is, if things are not working fine for you, you can talk to the API and get out of this lab. I will talk about this in a second. But first, what you actually want to achieve in the lab, right? Say you join the lab with certain wish, but what is this wish? What do you want to achieve working in the lab? First and foremost, you want to understand how things work. What is an experiment? What people aim to do when they set an experiment? Uh, what does it mean to have a reproducible experiment, reproducible data? What is the data variability, uh, which we call data analysis? Uh, it's linked a little bit uh, uh, to statistics and so on. These are very important, with very important factors. Of course, um, it's it's very important you to learn how lab is functioning. What is lab ethics? Um, how to treat your colleagues? Because again, when you be in a grad school, they will be one of the most important assets, especially if you get in a big lab, right? You wanna you wanna know how you wanna learn how to how to build up relationship with your colleagues, you know, normal uh, uh, professional relationship. Of course, like I said, you want to understand your project. That's it's a super important thing because there is nothing more disappointing to have a student who worked in a lab for a year or a year and a half who has no idea, who cannot explain what he was or she was doing. That's very disappointing. Okay, but ultimately, and that's unfortunately students, very few students know and understand this. You want to get data for a poster. Nearly in all universities, at least in all big universities, and if you're in a small university, then I bet you have a big university in a close proximity to you, 
the REITS conference, we call it here at Texas A&M Student Research Week, it's in April. And that is an opportunity for you to go and present your paper uh, in the form of a poster, right? Of course, to have a poster, you have to have a good chunk of data, reproducible, valid data. And that's why you want to start working in the lab uh, the earlier you can, right? Say, if you come talk to the professor in September and the conference is in April, unlikely you can present. There's just not enough time for you to get there. But next year is when you can go and present. So be strategic about in, during your conversation with the professor and ask about it. Say, well, look, I want to put a poster together, go and present. Now, what the poster gives you? First, you can put in your CD that you presented the post. It would look super good in you. Why? Again, because it will set you apart from a bunch, uh, from your cohort of students, uh, your, uh, the cohort of, of applicants. Why? Because everyone understands that many people work in a lab. But if you presented the poster, it means you're very focused, you're very motivated, and you were a hard worker. Because all these components is what make you gather data and put them in the form of the poster. Also, you will see that presenting a poster is fun. You can talk to a, a large number of people, judges, uh, guys from your cohort, uh, people from other departments, and you'll be like, wow, it's so cool. I can tell people about what I've done in the lab. And, and you, will, you will learn how to build a story, how to make a poster, which are very important uh, skills uh, in a grad school. Lastly, what I can tell you is that if poster presentation of the poster would push you to top 10% applicants, a paper would push you to top 1% applicants. And it's completely fair to, to expect to have a paper. Most of my undergraduate students have the first author publication, which is very unusual. Uh, and it's kind of you know normal thing in, in our lab. Uh, but uh, in many laboratories, you can get a third author paper, a fourth author paper. Nevertheless, this is going to be a publication that will be solid record that you were working hard, that your data was meaningful and that it was useful, right? You, the piece of data that you produced was actually useful. And that's why it made to the paper. And like I said, you can put this paper in your resume saying, I have published the paper. All this data is going to be published in the paper. And I'm sure if it's true, your, uh, <clears throat> your research advisor when will be, or she'll be writing a recommendation letter would, would uh, 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 emphasize this. Well, uh, what if something is going wrong, right? Uh, what if, you know, like I said, no one cares about you. You're sitting in the dust. Well, move, you know, don't sit in that place. Don't sit in that lab. It's fine for you to come and talk to the PI. And of course, we'll ask maybe, you know, I can be moved to uh, in a different project or I can join a different student. But if things don't work, just move, okay? You don't waste your time because you don't have too much of your time, all right? Now the question is, well, you are from a very small college and there are, there are no labs around you, or maybe there are no labs, say you wanna do neurobiology, but there are no labs that are doing neurobiology. Like I said, it's still worth joining a lab that has related expertise, a related type of a project, because you will learn a lot about, uh, you know, web laboratory ethics and so on and so on. But there are, opportunities around you and these opportunities may be in your university uh, like mark for example arise just approach your undergraduate office and ask them whether there are opportunities in your own school that can let you uh, that can will provide some money for you to go somewhere and work okay there are federal programs uh, such as uh, reu for example this program is uh, aimed to attract underrepresented minorities, okay? There are uh, SURF and SUR, uh, as well as Amgen scholars. These programs allow you to be funded to do research for two or three months in the best schools in the country. It's awesome. Last year, I had a student from my lab who uh, went and worked at uh, Brandeis. And of course, I was, you know, I, I wasn't in, terribly happy because he was a great student. I wanted him to work during the summer in my lab. And I was super supportive. I said, absolutely go. And he went to Brandeis and he worked in neurobiology, which is great, right? Because uh, even if you're from small college, there are opportunities uh, that you can see right here. And I'll be glad to talk more about them as well as please approach uh, the outstanding uh, uh, graduate uh, school uh, manager from uh, our department, Justine uh, de Gruter, she would be, uh, I'm sure, happy to 
to provide more information on every single uh, opportunity that you can see here. Uh, and like I said, you will be in MIT, uh, Rice, uh, you name it, uh, uh, Northwestern University doing this research during the summer. And that's an opportunity. So <clears throat> remember, you have to knock at the door. If you're a smart guy and you don't see opportunities, it's just because we don't know about you. So knock at the door. And then once you knock at the door, I'm sure lots of doors will open. You will see that people, people would like to have you in the lab. And like I said, uh, in, through both the federal programs as well as through uh, industrial companies. I just talked to a good friend of mine at Regeneron, and he said that at Regeneron, one of the best pharma companies located in upstate New York, he said that they have programs for undergraduate students. So you can just apply and do research uh, during the summer at Regeneron. And of course, once you're there, and if you want to, to uh, continue to pursue a career working in the industry, sure, it's the right thing to do because they will know you, right? And if you're an enthusiastic guy, I'm sure they will invite you to uh, stay after your graduation. As well as, of course, there are opportunity in national labs uh, where you can go and work during the summer. Lastly, I want to tell you guys, nothing is impossible. I had a, uh, when I was in Belarus, I had a friend, uh, she was a year uh, younger than me, and uh, after graduation, I applied to graduate schools in Germany. I didn't get accepted to any. And uh, she, we had a conversation some, you know, somewhere down like February, and she said, well, I, want, I have a friend living in Berlin. I want to, I'm gonna be living in Berlin during the summer. Do you know any research lab I can, I can get into? And I called, uh, Max Denbrook University in Berlin, the place where I applied, that's why, that's how I knew them. And I asked them, guys, is that possible that an undergraduate student will work in your lab during the summer? They were like, absolutely, yes, sure. We're glad to have her, we, don't, we cannot pay her. And I was like, well, she has her own funds to live in, the place to live. And because of that opportunity, they made her an offer. She applied to that school and they made her an offer also because she had that research experience. She applied to DAG, it's a German uh, fellowship that is very similar to NSF here, and she got the fellowship from DAG. So working two months in the summer, she got two fellowships, okay? That is uh, how it works. You know, just make the first step, don't be afraid. If you like research, write to us, write to uh, other universities, ask for research opportunities. Say you have a friend, you're from a small college, but you have a cousin of you living in San Antonio or in Austin. Well, maybe you can sleep on the couch for a couple of weeks in that place. And that's how you can work in a, in a good lab, in a cancer lab in University of Austin or University of, uh, University of uh, Texas at Austin or, or uh, San Antonio or in any, in any place in, in, in Texas. Well, with all of this, I want to thank you all. I'm glad to take questions. Sorry, I'm a little bit running behind. Here you can see uh, undergrads whom I, I was privileged to have in my laboratory uh, on the left, you can see Isaac Esparza. He got the award, the med gold medal, uh, because of his research, uh, uh, as well as other guys who are happy because they, they work hard, they learn a lot, they publish, and uh, overall, if you are interested to know more about my group, please drop me an email. I'll be glad to talk to you and to introduce you to my group. Uh, now we have uh, virtual Zoom, so you can uh, Zoom with us and, and see what we do. But now I want to spend a couple of minutes answering questions. And I see a uh, uh, couple of questions, I guess. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, read one off for you, Dimitri, if that's all right. I think we have time for one. So Tristan asks a really interesting question. Um, it seems that there are an unlimited number of opportunities and ideas and research that you can pursue. So how do you suggest that students who are interested in everything start to narrow down their interests and how do they start sort of gathering the focus needed to really commit to a single project or field? Well, it's a good question. Uh, again, look at opportunities around you, right? Say, if you dream about particle physics, but there are no nuclear accelerator around you, probably it's really hard for you to, uh, to uh, pursue directly uh, with that research. But uh, again, if you like, say you like neurobiology and there are no neurobiology lab around you. Well, but there is a lab that does very nice uh, uh, work on neurodegeneration or some kind of a structural biology maybe join that lab and you learn a lot and then pursue uh, then, then apply to uh, any of this uh, MGEN or RUE, uh, 
are you sorry uh, summer opportunity and one thing i want to add, add to this if you guys were not accepted to the summer research opportunity it just means that you were not accepted it doesn't mean you're a bad researcher it means you're a great researcher but say you're a white male guy yeah you were not accepted to the program that supports underrepresented minority i will not be surprised it doesn't mean you're a bad researcher so don't stop if you hear it no continue applying knock at all doors one door will open Awesome. Um, well, I think that's time for today. So thank you so much, Dimitri, and thank you all for attending. We will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoy the weekend.